Let's start with prayer. Yeah, Heavenly Father, um, we'll be home soon. We'll be home soon. And one day, Lord, we'll see you face to face. And we'll see the beauty of your face. And we'll want to dwell with you all the days. To be in your house, Lord. And so, God, until then, I pray now that we would listen, uh, we would learn and do whatever it is that you want us to do. Thank you, God. You are here. You are here right now. You are present. And so, God, we respond to you. We want to hear from you. So, God, speak to us now. In your name, Jesus. Amen. Amen. Uh, brilliant. Before I speak, I'm going to invite uh, Hilary to come up to just do the reading. And her dog. <laughs> Sorry. Sit. Please don't be distracted. <laughs> because this is the word of God. And the dog isn't. <laughs> now, there was a Pharisee, a man named Nicodemus, who was a member of the Jewish ruling council. He came to Jesus at night and said, Rabbi, we know that you are a teacher who has come from God. For no one could perform the signs that you are doing if God was not with him. Jesus replied, very truly I tell you, no one can see the kingdom of God unless they are born again. How can someone be born when they're old? Nicodemus asked. Surely they can't enter a second time into their mother's womb to be born? Jesus answered, very truly I tell you, no one can enter the kingdom of God unless they are born of water and the spirit. Flesh gives birth to flesh, but the spirit gives birth to spirit. You shouldn't be surprised at my saying you must be born again. The wind blows wherever it pleases. You hear its sound, but you cannot tell where it comes from or where it is going. So it is with everyone born of the spirit. How can this be, Nicodemus asked. You are Israel's teacher, said Jesus. And you don't understand these things? Very truly, I tell you, we speak of what we know, and we testify to what we have seen. But still you people do not accept our testimony. I have spoken to you of earthly things, and you don't believe. How, then, will you believe it? If I speak of heavenly things, no one has ever gone into heaven except the one who came from heaven, the Son of Man. Mo just as Moses lifted up the snake in the wilderness, so the Son of Man must be lifted up, that everyone who believes may have eternal life in him. Amen. Amen. So, a really vital conversation between a Pharisee named Nicodemus and Jesus. Uh, Jesus has laid out what the requirement is to know God and to see the kingdom of heaven. And it's a hard requirement. It seems impossible. He says to Nicodemus, you must be born again. Naturally, Nicodemus' response is one that we would all ask. How can I be born again now that I'm, I'm, I'm an adult? The problem with his response is this. He's thinking way too much externally and practically and what he thinks he needs to do in order to be closer to God. But Jesus is speaking about the change in here. In here, to be born again spiritually inside. And this work that changes us internally is done by whom? 
the Spirit, the Holy Spirit. Jesus says, you must be born again by water and Spirit. And so that's what we're looking at today. The transformed life by the Holy Spirit. The work of the Spirit at someone at conversion. And what this looks like. But firstly, who is the Holy Spirit? He seems like the mysterious one out of the three. God the Father I can understand. Uh, God the Son I, I can understand. But who is this Holy Spirit who, who seems so hard to grasp and figure out? Uh, one way to understand uh, the Spirit is by picturing the Trinity like a body. It's not a um, perfect analogy. But let's say that God the Father is the head who seems to have the top authority out of three. The Spirit and the Son obey and listen to him. Jesus would be the body as he came to earth to be part of uh, humanity, to appear human and for his body to be sacrificed. Then the spirit would be like oxygen, oxygen in our lungs. For that's what the word spirit means, to breathe. He is the breath of God who gives life. I mean, read this all the way back in uh, Genesis chapter 2. Without the Holy Spirit, we'd still be dust on the ground. God breathed into man's nostrils the breath of life. And the man became a living being. So it's fair to say this, the Holy Spirit empowers and gives life, but not only does the Spirit give life, in fact the Spirit is responsible for quite a lot, not only does he give new life, but he purifies, he reveals, he gives the evidence of God's presence, he guides and directs, he teaches, he gives assurance, he unifies, he is responsible for work within prayer, baptism, spiritual gifts and spiritual maturity. It's fair to say that the Holy Spirit does a lot for one who seems so mysterious. And in fact, out of the three, the Holy Spirit is the one who is mainly present with us today. Jesus said to the believers in John 14, He will send the Advocate, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name. He will teach you all things and remind you of everything I have said to you. So to sum it up, the Holy Spirit is the active presence and power of God in the world, Amen. and especially the church. Amen. So we really need to pay special attention to the Holy Spirit. As I said earlier, I want to specifically look at and focus on the work of the Spirit when someone becomes a Christian, when someone becomes a Christian for the first time, when someone is converted. Firstly, what is conversion? What is conversion? Jesus says in Matthew 18, unless you... you um, Unless you're converted, you cannot see the kingdom of heaven. Unfortunately, the word conversion is seen as a very um, negative word, right? It's um, used as a bit of an aggressive term. It's like, you need to be converted, you know? It's, 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 it's lost its meaning. And it's actually lost its beauty and, and meaning. Um, so to help better understand, um, Terry, can you just stand up so we can get out of the Okay, you have one, you have one take of the stairs, don't, don't ask that. So what I want you to do is just face that way, okay, and what, what I want you to do, right, is simply just turn around and face it around. Well done, you can sit down. A round of applause. <laughs> okay, so, so what converted means, so Terry, Terry demonstrates it perfectly what conversion means. It means simply to turn. It means to turn. It's to turn uh, completely around and face a new direction, and that's the perfect metaphor an image of what Christian conversion is. On one, on one hand, Christian conversion is this radical inner transformation. And on the other hand, it's not so much a, a, a replacing of what you are, but a refacing of what you are. In other words, your temperament doesn't go away. Your, your culture doesn't go away. But now everything that you are now is lived on a whole new basis. Everything you do is done for a different reason. Amen. Different motivations towards a different goal. Amen. Your entire life has changed. And the Spirit is the only one Hallelujah. who can do this. But before we look and explore more about what this Holy Spirit conversion looks like, I want to start off with what conversion isn't. It isn't to become more religious. 
it, it's probably the biggest myth within Christianity and, and how Christianity is used. Yeah. When the average person hears the call to be born again, what do you think that is? I believe the average person would say it's a call to be more moral and religious. If you think being a Christian is purely following a set of rules and commands, or to look like you're, you're pretty well put together, you'd be mistaken. Just look at the character of Nicodemus. He's a powerful man. He's a religious man. He's, he's a, a man who, who, who has strong morals. He, he's not arrogant or proud like other religious leaders of the day. In fact, he, he knows that Jesus comes from God. In verse 2 he says, Rabbi, we know that you are a teacher who has come from God. So what does Jesus say to Nicodemus for him to know God? Does he say, well now, Nicodemus, you're... You're a really great person you are. You're, you're really close. You're a moral, really good person. You just need to do a, 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 couple, a couple more things. You need to do a little bit of tweaking and you'll get there to truly follow God. Does that make really sense? <laughs> and he says to Nicodemus, you must be born again. What a powerful statement. So what Jesus is saying is, is that you need to start from scratch. You need to start some, from scratch. Everyone needs to start from scratch no matter how good you are. All have fallen short of the glory of God. Like I said, this isn't how we typically think, isn't it, when we, when we think born again. We can understand how uh, being born again might be relevant for those whose lives are in a complete wreck, for those who are in desperate need of saving and are struggling. But look at, look at other people like Saul and Cornelius, who are seen as moral and righteous men of the day, who are still in need of radical transformation. In fact, when the spirit converts, it's actually a challenge to religion and morality. Some of the most self-proclaimed moral people of today in the UK, the ones who say they don't need help, are actually in the most desperate need of transformation. So why is this? Why is this? The Bible says the problem of the human race, it's a big statement, okay? The problem with the human race, I think it's one that we want to know, okay, is that Human beings put themselves in the place of God. Human beings put themselves in the place of God. But do you know there's two ways to make yourself God? There are two ways. Two very different ways to make yourself your own saviour and lord. One way is to break all the moral rules, and the other is to keep all the moral rules. One way is to say that I'm going to live the way that I want to live and trample on other people, and the other is to say that I'm so good that I've earned my salvation. One of them makes you a criminal, or the other one makes you a stuck-up Pharisee. Or, or a person who's always feeling guilty because you never feel good enough. Both approaches point to you being your own Lord and Saviour, both ultimately rooted in pride. If the Gospel is true, then your conversion doesn't even begin until you realise the difference between what it means to be born again and what it means to be good. They have a completely different basis. One means you're trying to do things in your own strength and for your own glory. The other is surrendering. It's surrendering and trusting the Holy Spirit and relying on His strength. So, how do we know that we, we have um, a, a truly Holy Spirit filled conversion? It's important to know, firstly, that conversion comes through God's initiative. Mm -hmm. It comes through God's initiative. It's never about you pursuing God. God is the one who's always been pursuing you. We only love because he loved first, says in John chapter 4. Christianity isn't this game of hide and seek where all must hunt to find God. No, it's the Holy Spirit who draws near first. And you can see this in, in every conversion in the Bible. Jesus appears to Saul on the road to Damascus. Philip is sent to speak with the Ethiopian eunuch. Jesus picks his own 12 disciples. God is the first one to make a move. Yeah. And it's the same with us. For anyone here who's been a, a Christian here for, for a long time, when you reflect back to when you first became a Christian, you realise it wasn't so much God chasing after you, uh, so much you chasing after God, but rather it's God chasing after you. And if you're here today, you might be in church for the first time. 
or thinking um, or thinking more about Christianity, or you may have further uh, questions about what it means to be a Christian. That's the beginning of God drawing near to you. Maybe you've heard a testimony that's really stirred you, or you find yourself more and more around Christians. God is pursuing you right now. You might not even realise it, but he's pursuing you. So what happens when we respond and the Spirit shows up? How do you know that I am truly transformed by the Holy Spirit? The main way that you know that you have the Spirit in you is that he changes what you worship. He changes what you worship. If you look at Pentecost, or any other, any other time the Holy Spirit is poured out, the first thing converted people do is that they praise and worship God. What's the big deal about that? What's the big deal about that? Worship is this. Worship is giving ultimate value to something. Ultimate value to something. That's what worship is. It's not just liking something. It's cherishing and ador- adoring something. Even if you say you're not religious or believe in God, you still worship something. Everyone has something they would give their life ultimate value to. What are you giving your life to? What are you giving your life to? If it's people's approval, that your heart cherishes and needs, then you're controlled by what people think of you. If the main thing is power, and maybe not people's approval, then you're controlled by status, or money, or whatever, someone else's money or or, or, or status. But you do not control yourself. (coughs) You're controlled by what you worship. You're controlled by what your heart most values, what it most adores, what it most desires, and you cannot change unless you change what you worship. And unless our worship is to God, every other worship is a counterfeit. Anything else that we pursue either doesn't last, it doesn't satisfy, or it's damaging. And I guarantee if you think about what you most cherish here on earth, that thing will fall into one of those three categories. We need drastic change. That's why Jesus said, be born again in the Spirit. To be converted by the Spirit. We need the Spirit to turn us around and be empowered. And this is and this all starts internally. This all starts in, in, inside. Don't go around looking externally to fix something that is a problem inside. I've seen it way too much with people that I work with and in my own life, and it doesn't work. It doesn't work. Repent by giving to God whatever it is that you're worshipping, and draw near to the Spirit, and ask for Him. Ask for Him to change you, and the Holy Spirit will make God's love real to you. How else does the Spirit change you? Another way that He changes you is sociologically. He changes how we view others. There are two really important moments in the New Testament. One being at Pentecost again, and the other is at Cornelius' house, which you find in Acts chapter 10. When the disciples were at Pentecost and spoke in tongues, who did they speak in front of? Did they speak in front of Jews? Did they speak in front of a, a certain people group? No, they spoke in front of people from different nations. These people from different nations could hear their own tongue being spoken by people who could not speak their language. They could hear praises to God in their own language. However, Peter didn't, being Jewish, didn't understand this straight away. It wasn't until later, when he actually got to Cornelius' house, who is a, a Roman centurion, centurion, a Gentile, and when Peter goes into Cornelius' house, he felt uncomfortable. It felt unnatural to him. And he says, what I'm doing right now is unclean. You know, this isn't something that we, we Jews do. We don't, we don't hang out with non-Jews. But when he sees the Holy Spirit outpour on them, and the Gentiles start praising God and, and speaking in tongues, that's when the penny dropped for Peter. He realised that in that moment that anyone, anyone can have access to the Holy Spirit. Not a certain people group, but anyone. In fact, Peter says in verse 34, truly, I understand that God shows no favoritism. 
if you are filled with the Holy Spirit, right? If, if everyone was filled with the Holy Spirit in, in, the, in the whole world, racism would end. Racial dominance would end. There is no culture or race that isn't more appropriate to carry God's truth. There is no people group in society that we can look down on. Anyone can come to Jesus. And if we think otherwise, then, then we're resisting the Spirit's transformation. The Holy Spirit can be outpoured on anyone. And if you think about it, there's diversity in the Trinity, isn't there? Three different roles, but the same God. God loves diversity. He loves unity. So we know, we know the Spirit is the one who draws near to us. He isn't distant. We know He changes us psychologically by what we worship and praises. And he changes us sociologically by bringing us in unity. However, what I've talked about is only possible by what the Spirit is converting us into or towards. He's, the Spirit is turning us towards Jesus. He's turning us towards the Gospel. You could be like Nicodemus. You could know that Jesus was an important man. But unless you take that further... Uh, and know what Jesus has done, then the Holy Spirit will never change you and you stay as you are. Unless you deeply believe, if you deeply believe, that you believe that Jesus was more than a good man, Amen. that he is and always Amen. will be God. Jesus took upon it everything we used to worship, anything that was controlling us, enslaving us upon himself when he died on that cross, so that we can have true freedom and worship God. Jesus took the wrath and fire of God so we can have the fire of God's power. Jesus was immersed in God's absence so we could be immersed in his presence. For some of us here today, we know this. We know this, some of us. You know the Spirit well. Some of us have walked with the Spirit and God for many, many years. But for others, I think I know why you're here today. I think there is a truth in your life that you don't know about yet and you're searching. Remember, God isn't a distant character who we're trying to get closer to. He is already here. He is already present and he wants to know us more. So I'm going to invite the band So what we're going to do now, what we're going to